All right, everyone, hello. Thank you for coming tonight. It's really exciting to see so many faces. My name is Samantha Gibbons. I'm a senior here, political science major, and I'm a little too tall. <laughs> and a Hispanic Studies minor. I'm here tonight as someone who's dedicated to understanding community leadership in the context of social injustice. I, I look at this through several lenses. First of all, through the Bonner Leadership Program and as a volunteer with the McCarthy Center for Public Policy and Civic Engagement. Again, I'm so excited to see everyone who's in, excited on this topic because it's widely, it affects all communities. Not just Falcon Heights, not just Minnesota, all communities. So thank you for coming. Just a little background for those who aren't too familiar. That's touchy. Uh, on July 6, 2016, the Falcon Heights community experienced a violent tragedy when Philando Castile, a 32-year-old black American, was shot and killed by a St. Anthony police officer. Tonight, we will hear from members of the Falcon Heights community who led the way from that difficult night to a more inclusive and a more healthy community. Tonight, I'm, I'm, ple I'm pleased to introduce our moderator, Ty Tynesha Ashley, who is a junior elementary education major and executive board member of the Black Student Association, BSA. BSA is also a partner in creating this event, and we're really fortunate to have BSA, Bonner, and McCarthy Cedar McCarthy Center making this possible, so thank you for everyone. She is also a resident assistant serving and, role model, and a role model for supporting our sophomore Bennies, which is a big job if anybody knows, so thank you for doing that. She's also an intercultural lead scholar and a 2019 Breakthrough Teacher Fellow, so she's very busy, and thank you, we're really pleased to have you moderating this. Mr. John. <laughs> Mr. John Thompson is the founder of, of Fight for Justice Enterprises and was a good friend and co-worker of Lando Castile. Lando Castile's death was a turning point for um, Thompson's life and since then has been compelled to be a voice for Philando Castile's and those who have been victimized such as Philando by injustice. He has spoken at numerous public and civic events from protests and demonstrations and city council meetings to addressing Minnesota's state legislature. Thompson works with numerous activists and civil, civic groups working for social injustice. So we are really lucky to have him here with his insights, and so thank you for coming and sharing your time with us. We're really grateful. <laughs> Next, we have Mayor Peter Lindstrom, who is an SJU graduate and was the mayor of Falcon Heights in 2016 when Philando Castile was killed by a police officer. He's currently a commissioner of the Twin, Twin Cities Metropolitan Council. However, prior to this, he served as, um, yeah, until this, he served as a mayor in the Falcon Heights for 11 years and was a city council member for eight years before that. His primary job today is a manager of the clean energy resource teams at the University of Minnesota, where he orchestrates outreach to local governments and schools to help them become more energy efficient and use clean renewable energy. So again, <laughs> last but not least, we have Councilwoman Melanie Leahy, um, who is the president. She wears many hats, I learned tonight. Um, she's very busy as well, everyone is. Um, she's the president and founder of March, which stands for Mobilizing and Releasing Caring Hearts. She's also the executive director of, uh, of Community Renewal of the Greater Twin Cities and has served as a council city member of the, for the city of Falcon Heights since 2018. Councilwoman Leahy served as a co-chair of the Falcon Heights Task Force on Policing and Inclusion. We thank you for your leadership and involvement in tonight's discussion. Thank you, everyone. And I will pass it off to Ms. Hello. Can you all hear me in the back? All right, great. Um, first, I would like to thank everyone for coming out tonight, and welcome to the College of St. Benedict for those of you who are here for the first time. Again, my name is Tynesha Ashley, as mentioned by Sam. Um, the central focus of this discussion is to discuss the tragic event that happened on July 6, 2016, 
but in the perspective of learning as a community how to heal, build trust, and to create and to create stronger restorative justice outcomes and policies. This means a lot to me for two personal reasons. First, I witnessed a young man only 17 years old die at my feet um, due to gun violence in my best friend's home. Second, gun violence and police killing is personal to me because my mom lost a friend on July 6, 2016, um, when Philando Castillo died. <clears throat> Like many others, I too am trying to heal. This is important for the world because all over, many black lives are being taken due to police brutality and excessive violence. Lately, I have been feeling like their stories ha has been used for clickbait, likes, and shares. I personally, be personally believe we need to reshift our focus to what we as a community can do to improve our communities. That is why this panel discussion is important. With that being said, I want to emphasize that here at the College of St. Benedict and St. John's University, we believe that this is a safe slash brave home for all, and anything opposite of that, as my mother would say, not in my house. <laughs> the, form the format for tonight's panel includes two short videos, some questions from me, and then some questions from you all, and then the way it's gonna work is um, you all will, some people be, will be able to pass their questions um, to the aisle where we will have students collect your questions and read them out loud. And then we'll also have a microphone um, roving around um, for your questions as well. So, sounds good? Great, great. All right. All right. <clears throat> now we will transition to the showing of two short videos. Um, first, a video featuring John Thompson um, called, Are You an Angry Black Man? And second, a video about the, Fal the Falcon Heights case created by the Minnesota State Office of Collaboration and Dispute Resolution. Okay, so I don't know about you all, but I teared up a little bit. So if I get a little shaky, if I could just hear some snaps, you know. Just. That'll help. Okay, so for the first question, to set the stage here, prior to July 6, 2016, the death of Philando Castillo, did you know each other? And what were you doing prior to Castillo's killing by police officer Yanez? So before you want to. I didn't know. Sorry. Um, anyone? Anyway, maybe just go down the line starting with. John, I didn't know, I didn't know, as a matter of fact, I've never known a mayor before in my life, or a city council person, I, I, I didn't, they were irrelevant to me, you know, I was a machinist, so I got it a normal nine to five, but then I get off work and I, I help my son do his homework and play the Xbox. <laughs> First of all, I want to thank the McCarthy Center and uh, St. John's and St. Ben's and the Black Student Association and, and Bonner for having us here today. It's, it's just a great honor. And although it's been three years, um, this is the first time that the three of us have been up on a stage like this. We've individually uh, spoken about this tragedy, I'm sure, on more than one occasion, but the first time that the three of us have been together, and so thank you very much um, for the bottom of my heart for, for having us here, and, and thank you, Ty, and everybody that helped pull this together. I did not have the pleasure of knowing this young man um, quite yet. Uh, the first time we met was, you probably saw it on the video, he was pounding his fist on the, on the podium. Uh, but I've known Melanie for, for many, many years. And uh, uh, so, at, as you learned in my introduction, I've been an uh, elected official for about 20 years, roughly, in Falcon Heights. Which I should say, I, I just want to give you just a little bit of a briefing on Falcon Heights itself. So we're a first spring suburb. We're smaller than St. Joe. We're 5,000 people and change. Um, 
We are probably one of the most unique cities in America. And I say that because we're in the heart of the Twin Cities. We're super small. But we have these two humongous institutions within our tiny 2.2 square mile area. And those two huge institutions are the University of Minnesota, the St. Paul campus, uh, with its agriculture research fields, and the State Fair. So, it's, so if you've been to the State Fair, you have been to Falcon Heights. Um, and so and at the same time, so we have this kind of this rural feel to us with the research fields there. And um, at the same time, we're about 10 minutes from, uh, from uh, both downtowns. Um, so I've had the pleasure of knowing Melanie for a long time, and I'll let Melanie take it from there. So um, at the time that Philando was killed, um, yes, I did know. Uh, I have known uh, Mayor Peter Lindstrom, and that is because with my nonprofit work that I do, primarily in urban settings, working in North Minneapolis and other places, to strengthen communities, to transform lives and communities, I don't just tell people they should do that in their own city. My husband and I, we model that where we live. And so, uh, newly married, I was approached to join one of the commissions. And I served on the Neighborhood Commission because I wanted to strengthen the community. I did not choose the Human Rights Commission because that was reactionary. After a bit of time, those two were merged together. And in my extended term on that, I was chair for eight of those 10 years. And in those last few months was when Philando was killed. At 6 p.m., I was talking to one of my board members and we were planning an event for my commission to deal with racial equity to help our small city of Falcon Heights prepare for the diversity that is coming It is here in Minnesota. And I did not know John at that time. Thank you, thank you all for sharing. So my second question is, what were your immediate reactions and um, your actions when you heard that Castillo was shot um, by police officer Yanez during a traffic stop? So, if I could go first on, on this one, just to tie in the two stories. So at 6 p.m., I'm, I'm talking to my board member planning an event for racial equity at Falcon Heights. By 9 p.m., just three hours later, Philando was killed less than a mile from my house. So I was being proactive, but it still wasn't fast enough for the St. Anthony Police Department. So when I found out the next morning that Philando was killed, first thing I did was call City Hall and went and met with my mayor and my city administrator. I said, I'm not leaving until we get this right. And that means to bring the healing, make sure that those in our community um, have an opportunity to speak and get to the core issues. And I mean, we were all in shock. But those are my first reactions and I knew I wasn't leaving until we brought change. And I'm still there to this day. So I was at my home and it was probably 9.30 or 10 o'clock in the evening when I got a call from our city administrator who told me that there had been a police shooting uh, on Larpenter Avenue and, and Fry Street. That corner is mm, less than a quarter of a mile uh, from my home, a couple of blocks. And the details were very sketchy at that time. And I will be honest with you, I kept waiting to hear uh, that I kept waiting to hear the reasons for the shooting. Why would somebody be shot? I mean, clearly this must have been a bad guy. Clearly this must have been someone who had pulled the gun on the officer. Clearly something, something, something must have happened to cause the officer to react the way that he did. And I, I never heard it. Um, I had just completed a book by former Minneapolis Mayor R.T. Ryback 
called Pothole Confidential. It's an excellent book. I encourage you to take a look at it. And in that book, he, he talks about how when he was mayor and a, um, a tragedy happened or there was a troubling situation, he would often go to the scene uh, and interact with the, the folks there. And I thought I should do the same. And so I went at about 10 o'clock, 10.30 at night um, to Larpenter Avenue and Fry Avenue, the scene of the shooting. And there was about 30, 40 people there, 50 people at that time. The, the police were there, of course. The, uh, the car was there with its lights still on. Um, and um, the, it was, you could tell it was escalating. The police did not want me to be there, quite frankly. Uh, so I went back. Um, I watched the Facebook Live video, which I'm sure many of you have seen, and um, I knew right away that it was going to be very bad. Um, my phone started ringing off the hook, um, and my cell phone was put out on Twitter, and so I eventually had to take my landline off the hook after I think I had 60 messages from people calling all across the world um, to my home. So, um, and then the next day, Melanie showed up uh, bright and early, and it was controlled chaos at that time. So, Mr. Lindstrom, um, not to cut off your time, but um, did you feel any pressure to um, take action? I, I know you had people at your door, um, was there ever any like pressure, pressure to like take action? There was pressure to take action from the first second. Uh, I heard about about the shooting, no question about that. Um, the folks at my door that I referenced in the video, that was a few weeks later. Okay. Um, and that, that was an uncomfortable uh, evening, no, no doubt about it. Um, but yeah, I, I felt overwhelmed. Uh, no question, I, we're a small town, I'm a small town mayor, and that, so how to react uh, was really up in the air for me. But I knew I, I couldn't do it alone, and I knew that we, we had a great community, we have a great community with smart people, and I needed to bring in other people to help me and the city council make decisions. <coughs> I didn't, I didn't, uh, because I saw the Facebook Live video and I scrolled right past it. So I didn't know that it was my friend that was murdered. Um, I scrolled right past it because we were so numb about it. And I don't know if people know, but uh, the day before Philando was murdered, me and Philando spoke um, right outside the store. We were going to grab him some Heineken. I was going to grab some Heineken. The day before Philando was murdered, me and him had talked it because the day before he was murdered, Alton Sterling was murdered in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And so we were so numb to the killing of Alton Sterling. I remember the conversation was like, man, nothing will happen to that officer. <laughs> and I walked in the store, it was a little bit more to the conversation than that, but we were numb to the, to the killing of Alton Sterling. And so with this Facebook Live video, I didn't watch the video. It wasn't until I got up to go to work in the morning that I saw Philando's picture on Fox 9 News, and I'm like, that was Phil on TV, oh my God, and yes, and then I, like everybody in my house, I woke up. Um, and then my job started calling. Uh, John, I know I post you with the field, so if you want to take the day off, you know, or we have counselors here, so I just talked to him about the murder of Alton Sterling, and then my friends murdered this, exact same way like the next day so you know that's where I was at you know, that was my world July 5th or 6th 2016 thank you thank you so my next question is actually for um, Councilwoman Lee um, as co-chair of the Falcon Heights Policing and Inclusion Task Force what can other communities learn from the award-winning processes you led? 
Well, I think it's important, first of all, to realize that I was doing this as a volunteer and not as a council person. And so each one of you in this room has a responsibility to love and care for the person sitting next to you, the people that you come across in the community where you attend school, where you work, where you worship, where you live. And if you have that as a core, you're going to go a long way. My personal model is I'm on a mission of love. So that comes out of every situation that I find myself in. And so there were other things that I did personally and through my nonprofit in this process in serving my community. And, and so I want you to know that it's everybody doing their portion. And I recently found a quote um, from Mother Teresa. It says, none of us, including me, ever do great things, but we can all do small things with great love. And together, we can do something wonderful. And so since I had already had uh, my uh, colleague, Ken Morris, assisting me with this event we were having in August, and we had a board meeting coming up, I was able to introduce him to our city mayor and to our city administrator, and he became the co-chair, the co-facilitator, along with Kathy Quick, who you heard mentioned. So this collaboration was from variety of resources to come together. And it took a lot of listening, a lot of honoring. When I approached my city council, I talked about having a posture of humility. Because it's easy in a situation to have a knee-jerk response and to be on the defensive rather than a posture of humility to learn from one another, to serve and listen to each other. And so with our task force, we had the opportunity to strategize and come up with ideas within the 13 of us that convene, and then to go and have the, the larger gatherings with the community conversations so that everyone could have input. And that input is what became the recommendations. And it is a slow process, but it's an important process. And if you want an answer to an incident, you can move somewhat quickly. But if you want to have lasting change for generations, you will consider taking the time and looking at some of the core issues. And we saw one of our core issues that we were addressing was trust. All of us, no matter the color of our skin, our culture, where we are born and raised, where we work, is going to boil down to trust is one of those key factors. So those are some of the things that we learned as we worked and collaborated together. And our work is not done. So, Mr. Lindstrom, um, this question is for you. Um, what task force recommendations are being implemented, and which ones are not being implemented, and why aren't they being implemented? And actually, anyone can answer this, but Mr. Lindstrom, if you would like to start it off, please. <coughs> I anticipated this uh, question might be coming up, so I, uh, I actually made a little, little list. Um, in terms of our task force recommendations, uh, which ones are being implemented, that would probably take the next hour to, uh, to go through in great detail um, all of the recommendations, because there's a whole host of them, but uh, I would say one major thing uh, is, of course, that we have a new police department. Um, patrolling Falcon Heights, number one. That is a huge deal. We had a, a police department for 20 years plus, the St. Anthony Police Department. To make that change was extremely significant. Um, one of the things that was a, a recommendation, which has now come to pass, is people were really concerned about ownership of our police department. So we have a contract. We have a contract policing um, situation, meaning we don't have the Falcon Heights Police Department. It doesn't exist. In the Twin Cities, we have a lot of shared services, meaning that one city will provide services to another city. Policing's no exception. 
So we don't have our own police department. We had St. Anthony provide that service for us for our cost. Um, they would come in and uh, do an annual report. So once a year, they would give an update on what they've been up to. Um, but we we do we did not have any power in terms of who they hired for their officers, what their department looked like, what sort of training did those officers go through, what sort of data were they collecting. We really didn't have a say. May I ask? In that. Is that a bit? Um, problematic. It's extremely problematic. <laughs> it's extremely problematic because you have people in your in your city uh, that are providing a, a critically important, if not the most important, service for your residents, and you don't have a say in the training, the hiring, that sort of thing. You can make suggestions, but you really don't have. The, the buck stops here say. Um, so that, we still have a contract situation. We now have Ramsey County. However, we have much more ownership because uh, Ramsey County provides this type of service for seven different communities in Ramsey County. And, and these seven communities get together on a monthly basis, if not more frequently, to make these decisions collectively what hiring, what the budget should look like, what the, what the technology should look like, should they have body cameras or not, um, uh, all of those things that I mentioned, hiring data, uh, they're, they're made more collectively than they were before. So that is a, that is a huge recommendation of, of one of probably 20, 30 or more that, that we've implemented in the last three years. Thank you. Um, did anyone else want to speak on this question? To repeat the question, <clears throat> what task force recommenda recommendations are implemented and which ones are not implemented and why are they not implemented? Excuse me. Certainly. I could address some of them. Um, so first I'll say why they're not implemented. Uh, some of the ones with policing we can't implement because of our ability as uh, Peter shared our capacity to make those changes. With the other ones, it is an issue of time and finances to do them all. It's a long list and uh, the council does intend on implementing those various ones and being as creative as possible and also looking for funding so limited funding has been provided, and with that, we have done what we can. We've created a line item within our city budget to accomplish more. We've even worked on communication. Uh, even correcting or, or improving the website helps so that there's better communication between staff and council to residents. That's critical. There is a request for resources around education, housing, and jobs. And so one of the things we knew we needed to do is to have a baseline. So we did a survey throughout the city that was mailed out, but we didn't stop there. We implemented something called SOS, so a survey on the spot, where we literally went to an intersection and got survey out to those who were driving through, commuting through Falcon Heights, so that they could give their input to the city as well. Because the city is not just those, it's a tale of two cities, those that live there and those that commute through there. It's a high number of, of commuters that don't live in our city that pass through Snelling and Larkinter. And then getting resources at that same time so that people have access to resources in the Ramsey County metro area. Uh, we've done a series of things around cultivating and caring community, having listening sessions, having special guest speakers, panelists at lunchtime. Uh, John was able to be on one of those panels and we're continuing to do that and listen to those that have come to those community conversations to give their feedback as well as we continue to move the ball forward to bring lasting transformation to Falcon Heights. Thank you. <clears throat> so my next question is my um, own personal question. Um, what did 
did you all do to bring awareness to Philando Castillo's um, um, tragic death? And um, yeah, I'll, I'll ask that first. I stood down the highway. <laughs> I showed down committee hearings at the state capitol. Like, I showed up to the mayor's house and stood on his grass. Um, <laughs> any place and anywhere that, because the thing is, like, I didn't know anything about, like, I did, but it really didn't matter to me, like, state legislators and, and mayors and city halls and what they did. That really wasn't on my radar. But now, Somebody's gonna answer to what happened to my friend. Um, like I didn't even. I, here's a, here's a, here's here's something interesting. Um, I show up at this guy's house and I'm yelling at him and I'm yelling about like, my friend's blood's on your hand and um, he invited me out to dinner <laughs> and he said. He said, I just became the mayor here in this small town to make a difference in my community. And he said, you know, I've never had a friend murdered. I've never had anybody murdered before in my lifetime. So I really don't know what to do. And I, I can remember him talking to me and then tears coming down his eyes. And I'm like, at this time, I'm looking at, like, I yelled at this man. He couldn't hold a city council hearing. If we shut it down. I'd bring 250 people with me. We shut this meeting down. The city councilman will get up and walk out, right? But at this moment, this is a guy with the tears in his eyes. Like, I realized, like, he eat rotisserie chicken from Walmart. <laughs> 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 right? But no, to, 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 to be honest, like, I realized, like, this guy has a, a cell phone bill. He has, he, has, he, has, he has grass that he has to cut. He's not. The person, and then keep in mind, my friend was killed in Falcon Heights by a St. Anthony police officer. Keep that in mind, like St. Anthony's the next neighborhood over from Falcon Heights. Falcon Heights caught most of the hell. St. Anthony caught, but Falcon Heights caught most of it. And so when I'm sitting down and I'm talking to her, and then Mel Melody on the other hand, I'm, I'm there with a lot of Black Lives Matter activists. And rightfully so, and if John, you're angry. People, people from Black Lives Matter are pulling me away from Melanie. Like, don't talk to her. The 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 uh, the mayor hired her to shut the crowd down, right? And then Mel, I don't know if people really uh, understand this song, but uh, two two uh, what is it? Two three weeks after after Philando died, I lost my mother, and I'm still showing up to the community to the hearings and yelling and and Mel. Try, Melody, Melody tries to pull me to the side and talk to me, and they're like, John, don't go with her because she's hired by the, the mayor to stop, silence us. And Melody says to me, no, come to the back. I want to pray with you. I'm like, you know, somebody with an agenda don't pull you to the side and say, come pray with me, <laughs> right? And so we prayed about not only Philando but my mother. And a lot of things that were going on, she said, John, you need to take care of yourself, right? And then Melanie said to me, can shit? Boy, you need to stop showing up to these meetings yelling all the time. You need to learn how to play the game. You can't just, you can't just pour the Monopoly board out and expect to play Monopoly. Like, you need to read the directions, and I want to show you how to play the game. <laughs> Like some of the most, like and it was 2016. I still tell this story today because I I use that. Like I know how to play the game now. How about that? <laughs> so I didn't know who John was, and when anybody came to Falcon Heights, we had a conversation like this during our, our dinner. It's like not in my yard, not on my block not on my watch. And that's how I felt about Philando dying in my city. So even though I wasn't an elected official, I wasn't a paid staff person, I just a volunteer in the city, it didn't matter if I was chair of the Neighborhood Commission, Community Engagement Commission, it didn't matter, it was in my city. So I took personal responsibility. 
So every time someone came to City Hall, I welcomed them as if they were coming into my home. I didn't care who they were. I didn't care what their agenda was, if they were for the city, if they were for Philander, if they were against Philander, it didn't matter. They were in my home. So I needed to make sure that they knew they were welcome and that they had a voice to speak. And giving them honor, that's about honor and respect and humility to each and every person. And I don't roll with, well, I'm a black person so I need to say this, or I'm in a white city so I need to do this. But who's, who am I at the core of, of Melanie? And that's how I need to respond with love and dignity towards people. And so when I would hold my city council accountable and say we need to bring healing, even if we didn't cause it, we need to bring healing, people thought that the council was telling me what to say. No, it was the other way around. I was telling them what I wanted. <laughs> say to anybody who was talking to John and saying, uh, you know, the uh, Melanie is just hired by the mayor uh, to do the mayor's bidding, they did not know, they do not know Melanie Lee. <laughs> I mean, are you kidding? That is a laughable uh, statement. And um, just taking a step back, I mean, I think my philosophy overall through this whole process and, and hopefully before is I, I love it when people come to City Hall and let us have it. If you, if you feel wrong, let your elected officials know that they are messing up. Do it in a respectful way, but you can be passionate about it. My God, I hope you're passionate about it. That's what I appreciate about John and, and a lot of other people through this process is that um, they got mad it, in one way, you know, really mad, but also mad in, in the way that you were saying before about making a difference and learning the game because that's how you actually make change. Um, and it takes time. I, I met with Valerie Castile uh, after the shooting. It was the most nerve-wracking I've ever been um, meeting with any individual because she had every right to be really, really, really mad. And um, she said, talking about these issues of police reform, she said, it's not a race, it's a marathon. And keep at it, Falcon Heights, keep at it. Thank you. John, in about a minute or two, can you please um, describe how you have changed after the video we um, saw in the beginning? And um, what is your involvement like in the community now? I, I know how to play Monopoly now. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I was, I was a very, very vocal activist, and people call me angry. John always shows up to the meetings angry and yelling, and rightfully so. My question to them back, and I threw it back in their faces, why aren't you as angry as I am? If you think I'm angry, why aren't you as angry as I am? Because you're right, I'm angry, and I have every right to be angry. Like, my friend, my friend, uh, I watched him, um, because I, I, I repaired a lot of his equipment at St. Paul Public School, so I watched him, like, he told me on the last day, on the last day I spoke to him, he told me, man, I love the kids. I'm like, man, get away from me. <laughs> we work for the same company, right? And so, then as, as, as he, when he died, I watched him like, put that dog on milk back. You're lactose intolerant. You can't have this right here because you can't have peanuts. And like, mm. but he had their allergies behind him, the kids that he served. So I really, really love the kids. And so I try to live my life like that because he's like, man, I love everybody. That was the last thing I heard him say, man, I love everybody. I'm like, ah, whatever, I'm going to get my hand again. But, you know, so, <laughs> so I try to live my life like that. Um, Melody gave me the best advice ever, like learn how to play the game. And so now I don't show up to the committee. If you see me back there yelling at this one representative, Nick Zeros, I actually said in that video, we're going to find people to replace you. You guys have been too comfortable with these seats making decisions that affect my community. So I, I, I'm running. I'm running for a state representative seat right now simply because I've been a I've, I've showed up to the committee hearings and I've yelled about things that they call me angry about. And 
yet and still I'm still angry. I'm angry about the school teacher I spoke to the other day who makes eight hundred and twenty one dollars every two weeks and her rent's fourteen hundred dollars a month. Those conditions still exist post Philando. And so I still have to yell. And as I said before, I am uh, uh, not an angry black man. I'm a professional angry <laughs> black man. I just learned how to, to tone it down um, to where I can actually effectively change the things that I want to see changed in my community. I can't wait on somebody who's had a, a seat for 20 years, right? Like I have to replace them. And that's, that's what after the protest looks like. Thank you. Now we're going to open the floor up to questions. Um, just to let you know, we may not be able to get to everyone's question, but um, yes. Um, if anyone has a question that they have uh, written down, we have um, student um, volunteers who will collect your questions and then say them out loud for you. for coming. Um, this question kind of comes with a small preface. Please stay with me. I swear I'm going somewhere. Um, no one knows in totality the significance of the history they are in when they are writing it. Today we have added another page to the conversation of making positive change. This question is directed to anyone who can respond from Tynesha to Leahy. Um, you look around this room and you see a room full of students. I see a room full of activists future teachers, scientists, historians, and peace diplomats. You have students and members from BSA, Climate Action Club, Campus Ministry, etc. Students who are willing to take this information, take this energy and these lessons and apply them to their daily lives. As it applies to CSBSJU, what are some things that students can take from this conversation and apply it immediately into their daily lives? This is to anyone who can. I have an answer. <laughs> I always have an answer. <laughs> Be exactly the change that you're trying to see. You have to be the, the change. Um, you can't wait anybody, any, on anybody anymore. Like, I don't know if you recognize this, but it's like a new uh, wave of, of politicians coming around. Like, uh, what is it, Andrea uh, 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 Cortez? Johan Omar, these, these politicians aren't waiting for, in their first term politicians, they're not waiting on people to tell, like they're actually being the change and unapologetic about it. So, like I don't apologize for being black. I'm, I've been black 40 years, so I don't apologize for being black. Be unapologetic about, you know, demanding and being the change that you want to see. And don't take no for an answer. It's always, you probably have to twist the arm a little bit. <laughs> Uh, my response would be um, get out of your comfort zone, uh, educate yourself, educate yourself about our nation's history, about redlining, about racism around bank loans, uh, educate yourself about Minnesota's history. You know, I, I like to live in this world uh, where I look down at the at the South and um, you know those statues of of uh, Jefferson Davis and. You know, gosh, how terrible they are down there, but up here, oh, no, oh, aren't we so wonderful? <laughs> well, look at our history, ladies and gentlemen. Look at our own history. Um, folks like uh, like uh, Henry Hastings Sibley. Look at, I think he was our first governor. Look at how he treated Native Americans in Minnesota. It is abysmal, abysmal record. And we have a city named after him and a state park named after him. So how are we doing, Minnesota? So educate yourself about our own history. A good source for that is a podcast I recently listened to called Seeing White. Seeing White. Um, I encourage you to, to check it out. It is amazing. 
and, uh, and organize, as John has said, as Melanie has said, get organized. Be mad, pound the table, but learn the game, and learn who else is mad, and form a little club. And whether you're mad at something at St. John's, St. Ben's, or St. Joe, or Collegeville, or St. Cloud, or Minnesota in general, organize and, and change. It can happen, it has to happen. In a few words, learn and lead. Always learn about yourself. Take care of yourself. Be a healthy person. Uh, because if you're toxic, it's going to be a lot harder for you to be a healer in your community. Uh, and then from there, you can be a healer. What's in your hand to do? There's this young woman who painted some artwork after Philando Steele. Never met him, but was impressed to paint a picture of him told a, a mentor of hers, her mentor used to be on my board. I get this call at 10.30 at night, so I get to introduce this artist to Valerie so she could hand deliver this painting and wrote a note to her on the back. And that's become one of the key art pieces that Valerie's family uses and that you guys also pick today. So I ask you, what's in your hand? What is your gift? And ask how it can be a way to lead and bring healing to others. <clears throat> um, hello. Uh, I feel like an important part of the conversation when it comes to these type of situations as ignored is police training and what's changing about police training what's being added on and being done. Um, so I wanna ask the panelists, what's being changed about the way police are being trained to make sure that these type of situations don't happen again? There's a, there's a statute in the books, it's Minnesota Statute 609.699, which is the use of deadly force statute. Even this is the statute in the books, and for the longest time, I've always asked for people at the legislative level to take a look at the wording in that statute. Because as I'm reading this, if you're yelling at an officer, if you make any sudden, he can shoot you and say, I'm scared. He scared me. And so for the longest time, people would always say, oh, yeah, John, I'm going to write it down, 609.699, right? And nobody's ever taken it. I didn't want you to take it off the books because I, I, I'm, I'm for sure that officers need this on the books it can, to defend their lives so they go home. But change the wording which makes that like so easy to fall back on. And for the longest time, people have like, like ignored that. Like John doesn't know what he's talking about. And so when I said this is what after the protest looked like, I'm no longer going to ask them to take a look at the books. I plan on sitting uh, probably the chair of that committee next to where we'll bring that up ourselves. Right? Like, I can't wait on anybody to do anything else anymore, man. Uh, we'll be sitting right here banging our heads. And you know, um, one of my favorite quotes from Martin Luther King was, um, our lives begin to end when we start being silent about things that matter. Well, I, I can't sit around and be silent no more. Like, I kind of know my calling in life. And that's the change of conditions that exist for African-American men that like, look just like me and you. And so I can't wait on, on, on uh, legislation or, or mayors or city council people. I can't wait on them no more. I just try to figure out a way to replace them. So there's a, uh, there's a body uh, called the Post Board in Minnesota. It's called, it's, I think it stands for the Police Officer Standards and Training Board. And what I've learned is that there are much more positive trainings happening in the last three years. Trainings around critical, it's called critical incident training, uh, de-escalation training, implicit bias training. Um, and uh, I think in part, I, I say that there's been some positive movement is because uh, Clarence Castile, the uncle of Philando, is on the post board. Uh, at least he was the last time. Uh, he still is. He still is on the post board. So, 
So again, uh, he is making a difference. Um, he's not sitting on the sofa just being mad. Um, he is actually working with police officers in improving the training that they are receiving. I know that uh, the Duluth Police Department implemented mental health training. So the more that that can get spread throughout our state and our country, that would be just tremendous. And I was able to meet that police chief of Duluth, and he has a willingness to work with cities that want to bring that in. And as part of our task force, some of us did ride-alongs with the Ben St. Anthony Police Department in Falcon Heights, and I asked them about that, and you know they were willing to consider other training. So it's knowing your police department and asking them questions so that these things become the standard for their police department. So it takes getting involved and asking those questions to bring the transformation. The other thing you can do as students and as voters is when politicians come by and knock on your door and ask for your vote, ask them, well, what are you doing about police training? What are you doing about implicit bias? How are you, what does your department look like? And I gotta say, I've had hundreds of conversations with elected officials and city staff over the last three years. And that is the one thing I always encourage them to do is say, ask these tough questions to your police department before something horrible happens. Thank you. Um, it should be mentioned again that if you see any correspondence on the other side of the room, collecting cards um, to add, answer questions, any and all. And if you don't want to write it down, but you know it and you want to say it, just let us know. Thank you, Dean. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that question is being turned in. I do want to say that there was a training, I believe it was in 2018, that got shut down because it was a training that Ann has used. And cities stopped sending people to it. They told their police officers they could not take that training. You shut it down. You shut down the, the training at the Mall of America. It's the uh, Bulletproof Warrior training. And this was fear-based training. It was training officers on how to make it home safe. Um, any other questions from the audience? Yes. Um, so as a person who's um, passionate about social justice and a person of color, um, a lot of times I feel that systematic oppression is, very, is a heavy weight. How do you continue to move forward and motivate yourself as systematic oppression continues? I have a nine-year-old son. Um, he's ten now. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> but I, and then I come here also, and I met a biochemist major, bio, and I met an education major, and I met so many. And but like, you guys are my future, and so like, my future looks bright. I can't stop because. I gotta make it better for people behind me. So I can relax. I don't know if, we, if you guys realize this, but one day we may be in these hum around chairs, me and Peter Lindstrom and Melanie. We may be the older generation and we're gonna need you guys. So the work that we put in now kind of affects how you guys live your lives. And I'm fine with y'all not being at this microphone, having this conversation. <laughs> when you turn my age, I'm fine with that. I think my job's well done. And also I know for a fact Melody and myself and Peter, our jobs are, are simple. It's just go into these spaces and throw seeds on the ground and come back and water them. <laughs> we have to lay down fear. And sometimes that means pressing through the wall of fear and literally tearing down the wall of fear. Because when we live in fear, it's going to hold us back from the fullness of our true identity of who we're meant to be. 
So when I see young black men, uh, young black women, one of the things I speak to them, not just in situations like this, but I speak to them long life. I look them in the eye and I speak to them the value of long life because our society does not value long life. So people are getting taken out because of gangs or, or drug addiction or all sorts of unnecessary things and police violence. So if we can spread the message of long life and valuing that and giving hope, that's going to help us go far as far. Go ahead, Jan. What's the next question? <clears throat> what are some ways that we as black Americans, um, that's the focus, but people of color in general, could support the people chosen to protect us, police officers, but also be comfortable with trusting we will live after the initial contact? If anybody would like to answer that. <laughs> I, could, I, could, I could definitely say, and it's kind of hard to say this, but I have to say it. I've said it again, you have to be the change you want to see. Um, do I trust police officers to this day? Absolutely not. Um, but I do also know that if I want to see a change in the police culture, I have to be the change. So I do also notice that there aren't many African-American police officers. So I go around and I ask, who wants to be police officers? Nobody, 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 especially in the African-American community. Okay, so if nobody in our community wants to be police officers, guess who's going to be policing? With, you know, with your kids. And so we got we to gotta even the playing field. We have to even the playing field. Uh, uh, I say this about uh, uh, Falcon Heights. We used to call Falcon Heights this, St. Anthony. And, and actually, I said that when Philando was murdered, I said he should have never been driving down Larpeter. He know better than be driving down Larpeter that time of night, right? I said the same thing about s this city here. Like, we same thing where we're at right now. They say the same thing about this city right here that I'm in right now. We're not supposed to be here. African Americans not supposed to be here at nighttime. There are little pockets here that feel that way. It's not until we come here and I have these conversations, right? Like I don't want to. I don't want to like not answer your question, but I just want to make sure that you know. In order to, to to not live in fear, we have to try to change the 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 do the, what we call it the paradigm shift, right? So we want to we want to try to shift the paradigm a little bit. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, another Can question. I just, add to that? Uh, I just want to add that there's roughly about 10,000 police officers in Minnesota right now. My understanding is that about 250 of them are black. 10,250. So one thing I'd say is think about uh, think about becoming a police, a police officer. It is an honorable profession, and they have a very difficult job. I've known dozens of police officers. Uh, and I tell you, one day they are, for one minute, they are delivering a message that a loved one has been killed in a car accident. The next minute they are breaking up a, a bar fight. I mean, it is. They are social workers. Uh, they are police people that enforce our, our laws. Um, it is it is a very tough job, but, but think about becoming a police officer or encouraging other people to be police officers because we need good people to be in the system that we have in order to change the system. Thank you. Um, I wanted to move on um, so that we can get to more questions. Um, did you have anything to say before? I did, but I oh, yeah. <laughs> Build relationships. So I have a couple of friends, uh, one that I've known since we were teenagers that became a police officer, and we're still friends to this day. So, and then when I spent time at Falcon Knight City Hall, I got to know by name some of the police officers. And those police officers I trust. I don't know all of them, but I trust them. So building relationship, because that lets me know who is safe, but then they also get to realize as people of color, oh, you know, it, it brings down some of their prejudice. So if I want someone to get rid of prejudice, 
I need to get rid of some of mine too and start building bridges called relationship. Okay, thank you. One of the other questions was, how did St. Anthony's community honor Fidel after the incident? Um, are you with Philando? Philando, I'm so sorry, I'm nervous. <laughs> so, I'm nervous too, so. Do you, do you mean St. Anthony or Falcon Heights? Two different cities. Uh, both. St. Anthony, Anthony honored Philando by sending the mayor and the city council um, a proposal and it said in order for us to continue policing here in the city of Falcon Heights if an incident like this ever happened again you would assume you would assume total responsibility and liability and I just looked at the mayor and said I know this guy, I know this guy I had a conversation with him so I know but thankfully um, we had a mayor with some common sense <laughs> And he turned down the, not only did he turn down the proposal, but fired him. Like, you guys are no longer the police here anymore. We're just going to. I, uh, I got a, so, I got a call from the city administrator that uh, said the city of St. Anthony wants to impose this on Falcon Heights that we would be responsible for whatever their officers did. We would be liable for whatever they did. I, I pride myself on being pretty even keel. I kind of just went all halt. <laughs> <laughs> it was crazy. I just, I just couldn't believe it that, that they were saying, oh, Falcon Heights, you are so terrible. You're such a crime-ridden community that um, even though even though you Falconites don't hire off, uh, the officers, don't train the officers, uh, have nothing to do with with the officers, uh, you're going to be completely liable for everything that happens within your border. Uh, it just it made no sense whatsoever to me and. It was a divorce, really, uh, between those, between the two communities. We were, we were ready to be done with one another. Whereas the city of Falcon Heights um, now has two days. Uh, July 6th is now called Restoration Day to see relationships begin to be restored or people to meet someone who's different from themselves. And then the next day is Unity Day where we come together and begin to put into practice what we talk about on Restoration Day. So we have two days of commemoration that we can do personally and collectively on July 6th and July 7th, perpetually. That was one of the, the best days. This was all Melanie's idea, by the way, these two days. And um, it was absolutely in my 19, 20 years of being an elected official, the best the best day that I've ever been a part of because we had a lot of folks like John who were pounding at the podium a year earlier. Now we had 250 of us Plus. or more uh, out in our lawn at City Hall, breaking bread together, dancing together, fist bumping together. <laughs> and uh, it was just a very special evening. I thought that the men ought to do the electric slide. <laughs> We actually have time for one more question, so let's make it good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my question is kind of to go back to the initial question that he read off, uh, which was my question about what we can do um, to support the people that protect us. Um, you guys went off to say, uh, become police officers and that's a little scary for people of our race because if you go back to uh, the Minneapolis shooting of a Caucasian woman and you weigh out the differences of how that played off uh, uh, the police was terrified they're in a dark alley 
their door is being, you know, tagged at after they're being called out. And, you know, they protect themselves as what he thought he was protecting himself. And he is sitting behind bars at this time or um, something to that nature. He had no chance. He stood no chance. So to tell African Americans or black Americans to become police officers, why? With things like that happening. It's a little scary. Um, yes, we want to protect our communities, but I think it doesn't, we don't have to become police officers to protect our communities. We just have to protect our communities together. Um, we have to, again, sit next to the people we sit next to and say, I love you as a person, as a human, and that you're worthy of life, period. And that does not require a badge. That requires humanity. So, I mean, my question is, is again, why? Why would someone of color choose to be a police officer in, in these communities when that doesn't look very good for them? The the uh, well, Justine 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 Demond was the the lady who was murdered. I'm very good friends with her fiance. Um, he works over at Misty Lake. But to to answer your question, um, we've been asking the police to be psychologists, police officers, security guards at the library, security guards at the nightclub, security guards at the liquor store, mental health specialists, moms and dads, right? The police should only be police. That's it, like, that's the only job they should have to do exactly what it says on the side of the car, serve and protect. Um, I can remember when it wasn't, it wasn't scary to be, um, to say I want to be a police officer. Right, it wasn't scary, and actually, in all actuality, we knew the police officers. I should I share something? Because uh, I was a bit of a misfit. I, I just need to share this. I was a bit of a misfit, and I can remember um, taking. We had a contest to see who could take the most Kool Aid out of Jewel Osco. And I walked in the store. I walk in the store, and I, I walk in normal. And then I walk out of the store like there's something in my arm here, and the officer knew my mother. And so he says, come here, Mr. T. He grabbed me, and when he grabbed me, all this Kool-Aid falls all out of the jacket, right? And my mother walks in, and she's like, I knew you were with me. And she's smacking me all upside my head, and the officer says to her, excuse me, ma'am, you can't do that here. <laughs> but if you take him in that room right over there, right? Those were the officers, when I say those were the officers, and I, I just so happened to not I don't want to not tell the truth, I hate to show you, but those were black officers. Those were black officers that live like six houses down. You know, uh, Phyllis don't like you hanging with Mr. Jackson right here, so why are you with Mr. Jackson right here? I should take you to your mama. You know, those, that's why I said, you want to, like, we have to, this is, this is a shame. Out of 10,000 officers, only 250 of them are black. I didn't even know that. And then we break down the demographics. How many of them are women? I know the city of St. Paul has zero black women. First of all, women officers. Zero. Zero. And so, the, 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 the playing field's not level, right? So we complain about officers coming from Elk River and and St. Cloud to come and police St. Paul in Minneapolis, right? Well, they know, they, they, they'll look at you in your braids and you look just like Shaniqua who, and they look at him with his dreads and he looked just like Musta, you know what I mean? And, and, and so they don't understand us. They don't understand that the, the kid with the sagging pants has a PhD. You know what I mean? They don't understand that two chains ain't just a rapper. He graduated with honors. You know, they don't understand, you know? So I, I, I try to like, try to bring somebody who knows how to change the conditions that exist in our community because they lived in our community. And that's why I say it's imperative that African Americans get into this profession also. Plus they make they make money. Like they have definitely good benefits. Um, would I be a cop? I'd have to be a little hypocritical. <laughs> no. Another good reason is influence. If you want to see change, you become a part of something so that you can influence. That 
Oh, man, I was the one that said that, so I should reply as well, right? But I, I think these two said it the best, but I would say uh, ask that question to uh, John Harrington, former chief of the St. Paul Police Department, and now um, who heads up, yeah, the commissioner of the Department of Public Safety, African American. Ask that question to Eddie Frizzell, who's the chief of the Metro Transit Police Department in the Twin Cities. Uh, ask that question to the chief of the Minneapolis Police Department. Debbie Montgomery. And Debbie Montgomery um, as well. Historical who's for St. Paul. St. Cloud. St. Cloud as well. Well, um, thank you all for your involvement uh, into uh, tonight's panel. Um, just a few things. I want to thank our sponsors. Um, Black Students Association, Bonner Leadership Program, and the McCarthy Center for Public Policy and Civic Engagement. And I hope you all get home safe. Thank you.